I am Alan Cecil. With me here is Dan. Dan Petro. And we're going to present on you're doing IoT... Well, you're doing it wrong. You say it. <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Uh, this is great. Uh, thanks again to uh, DEF CON for having us. I'm um, really happy uh, to be here. This is a pretty big issue. Um, one of the things that's sort of unique in the um, IoT landscape is that there's not very much tying IoT uh, devices together. Um, they're very heterogeneous as a you know group. It's hardly a group at all. They uh, have, share almost nothing together in terms of hardware or in software. So it's pretty unlikely, uh, pretty rare for a single like issue, a single vulnerability per se, to uh, affect nearly all uh, IoT devices, and uh, I've got bad news for you. So uh, before we uh, talk much about uh, random number generators, let's talk first about random numbers. So uh, random numbers are kind of a stand-in for just about anything that a computer might need. Obviously numbers are kind of how computers work, and so a random number generator doesn't necessarily have to make numbers exactly, right? We're talking about encryption keys, authentication tokens, and lots and lots of other things that can be covered uh, under uh, business logic. Yeah, so th there's, there's some interesting things about random numbers. Uh, so computers are notoriously bad at making random numbers. For the task stuff I do, I rely on them being bad at this. Um, in general, you want a computer to do deterministic things. So if you need to actually get a random number out of a computer, you need some kind of hardware RNG to make entropy, uh, which should solve the problem of getting random numbers, right? Yeah, so uh, that's how we uh, started all this, obviously, was uh, sort of thinking that uh, hardware random number generators surely are the gold standard for um, generating entropy, for generating random numbers. Oh, also, as a quick aside, we'll be using the word entropy uh, around, throwing that word around. It's not actually going to be important that you understand the technical meaning of it. Just sort of assume that it means some quantifiable amount of random numbers. Uh, so, like, you have 121, like, 128 bits of entropy, that means a thing. Um, but it's not really important for the purposes of this talk to dig into that much further. Um, so, there are two kind of broad categories of random number generators uh, that we're going to care about here. There's the uh, pseudo random number generators, which are software, um, and true random number generators, uh, TRNGs. Um, in particular, uh, I hate the term uh, true random number generators uh, because it sort of implies a certain quality to them, right? That you might think of this, you might look at this and say, well, if I want a secure device, surely I want a true random number generator. I don't want any of those stupid pseudo random numbers. I just don't want pseudo random numbers. I want true random numbers, right? That's not, it's the, the, the names are leading you astray here. So don't get too caught up in the names. Really the only distinction is one is made in the hardware and one is made in software. Really they should be calling these hardware random number generators. That's a much better name. Get your shit together. Um, uh, so within pseudo random number generators, there's two kind of basic kinds. There's like the regular ones, so like the Mersenne Twister, Libsy Rand, all kinds of algorithms basically that start with a seed, of an initial number, and then from that produce an endless stream of bits there forward. Um, the regular ones are not meant to be secure. They just like make good random numbers for ordinary non-secure usages. Um, things like the Mersenne Twister. And then there's uh, cryptographically secure pseudo random number generators, or Suspingerga for short, um, uh, that are like cryptographically secure, meaning that there's no way to take the output from it and derive any of the other inputs uh, from it, any of the previous values or the seed from it. Uh, all right, so hardware design. So, how do you actually make a piece of hardware that generates random numbers. Uh, it turns out it's actually really hard to do this properly and lots of times you might think that you're doing and doing it wrong. Um, the, one of the other troubles about this though is that uh, trying to get any information on how any particular device works, the particular like uh, IoT SOC actually does its random numbers um, is really hard. Uh, if you try looking up the documentation, the answer is invariably fuck you. So the uh, the one exception to this is the STM32 from uh, uh, ST Microelectronics. They actually have really great information, upon some of which this is based, on how to generate random numbers. Um, so the, we'll go into um, uh, two really good uh, examples here. Uh, the first is using like an analog circuit method. But this isn't an exact logic diagram that you see on the screen here, but basically the way that it works is that you have uh, like a, a, a loop in a circuit that has like a not gate in it. And it's just going to kind of loop back and forth over and over again. It's not clocked by anything. And so the rate at which it's going to spin, going zero and one, zero and one, or depending how you implement it, it could actually be um, uh, intermediate values in the middle actually. 
uh, the rate at which it's spinning is not clocked. So it's just going to kind of be an arbitrary, not necessarily random, but arbitrary and sometimes fluctuating um, frequency. And so if you just kind of poll, if you just ask it, hey, at any given moment in time, hey, what are you, a zero or a one? It's going to be kind of arbitrary. Uh, not like necessarily random, right? But uh, certainly arbitrary. Um, and then there's other methods too. Yeah, the other way to do it is with two clocks that are running at different speeds. So you have two independent clock sources, say two uh, quartz crystals, and you're measuring the difference between the two. Because those two clocks are not tied together, there will always be a little bit of a difference in time between the two. So you can measure the delta, the difference between the two, and get a normalized distribution effectively. This is oddly something that I struggle with on the tool-assisted speedrun side when I'm trying to run stuff on a Super Nintendo because they happen to use two different clocks, one for the main CPU, one for the audio processor. They run at different speeds and it makes it very hard to get deterministic results. So unintentionally in a video game console of all things. But most of the time you'll see these implemented in a, just a, a black box. You can't really see what's going on inside of it. You just get the result out of it. Yeah, so there's a number of issues that can run up from uh, some of these designs, right? Uh, so you imagine this, uh, the first method, the analog clock method. So you're just, like, you have this, uh, this uh, circuit that's looping, right? Well, what if it's the case that your CPU is much faster than that loop is? You might ask it, hey, what is the value of it? Okay, it's a one right now. And then really quickly afterward, you ask it a second time, and it didn't get a chance to loop around. It's going to give you a one, and then a one again, and then a one again. Or what if you're, like the clock that you're um, asking it at just happens to be at a multiple of the frequency of the thing, right? You're always going to get the same answer every single time you ask it. So this isn't actually a really hard problem uh, so that in order to like generate random numbers. In the like laptop space, like if you have a desktop computer, a laptop a server, um, there's some like beefier methods of doing this that involve like pulling entropy out of the universe through like electromagnetic frequencies and crap like that. And uh, but, lava lamps. And lava lamps, you know. Uh, but um, in the IoT space, things have to be really cheap, obviously. So these are two really common designs that you're likely to see. Sure. So um, in uh, the, uh, the year 2021, most devices uh, have, uh, most um, IoT socks that you buy, a, a system on a chip, uh, how you start an IoT device, will have a hardware RNG peripheral on them. Um, that is a, like, a, piece of a piece of hardware, it's a, a device that's made to do this one and only one thing. Um, the, uh, we, surely you must think that like, that's fine, right? That's super secure, like what's the worst that could happen? Um, the, the problem starts running in that there's no operating systems in IoT devices typically. That really what you're doing is just writing C code that runs on bare metal. The, when you talk to a peripheral, like any other kind of peripheral, you, the operating, uh, you, the, uh, the user of this device, has to write code to talk to that individual peripheral at the hardware level. Um, C is hardly even, C is usually derided as a portable assembly, but it's not even portable in the IoT world. That like trying to run it against a different device is not even really a thing that works. Works. So this is not any different in the world of uh, hardware RNG peripherals. You basically are given something like this. There's a how, a how function, a hardware abstraction layer function uh, that says, here's how you call the RNG. It's a C function that looks something like this. So if you're not familiar with C, um, there's a the function name that's how get random number. This is just pseudocode. Obviously, every device is going to call it something slightly different. Um, it'll have uh, an output variable, which is a bit weird if you're not familiar with C. Um, this will come up later, so uh, keep in mind the, uh, this. But you're, you give it a pointer to a region in memory that says, here's where you should put the results. Um, so it's an output variable. It's usually a 32-bit um, number. Um, and then it'll return uh, an error code, uh, whatever that happens to be, a Boolean, an well, unsigned 8-bit integer, whatever that happens to be. So I'm going to let him take the rest of this part. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, the, of those two parts, of, like, there's really two things we care about here, right? That output variable and return code. So um, you, you can ask the natural question, which is the first question that we thought of um, uh, upon doing this the research was, there's an error code, huh? Like, uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're calling a piece of hardware. Uh, like, what if the hardware just isn't ready yet? Or what if, like, it was busy? Or what if, like, the relative positions of Jupiter and Saturn aren't aligned for all we know? Like, the hardware could just have an error. And, like, what happens if it errors? And what happens? How many people out there are actually checking this code? Uh, turns out, almost nobody checks the return code of the hardware RNG function. Um, these are just uh, uh, two examples. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what we're finding is that 
code online repeatedly just doesn't even bother to check the the error code. So what happens when you don't check the error code? <laughs> well, um, undefined behavior happens. It's, it's not written down what will happen. So usually undefined behavior is uh, undesirable. So there's a couple of interesting things that can go wrong. Um, usually you are going to get either partial entropy, like some of it is, is random, some of it isn't. But one of the interesting results is the number zero. A lot. There's an example down here where the first call got random numbers. The second call, still random numbers. The third and fourth call, they're just zero. And you might not necessarily notice this when you're, uh, when you're looking at a file. It might not necessarily pop out at you right away. You can get things that look like they're pretty random, but they're full of zeros. Um, this is the classic XK XKCD joke of uh, dice roll. Okay, we're just going to return a static value, just a constant. Here you go. Oh, actually, here. Oh, you have so one there's um, uh, the XKCD joke is, is sort of a joke, but it's also kind of um, an actual real problem. If you see a number uh, like we have to deal with here, right? How do you know that those zeros are like not random? You are sort of left with this like deeply existential problem, which if you try thinking about it too deeply, it will cause you to go into a deep existential panic, and I recommend you not do it. But you're actually left with a real logistical problem of like how do you know random data? versus not random data. It's not labeled for you, right? Like how do you know that? And so we'll, the, much of the uh, brunt of our talk at the end here is going to dig into exactly that. Um, so this is also um, anecdotally um, how this whole thing sort of got started. We, um, uh, pen testers obviously, uh, Bishop Fox, and uh, uh, we do a number of what we call product security reviews where um, if it's like, you, usually we say like if, it's a, if it drops when you break it, then it's a product security review. And um, so we, uh, on one occasion we're on uh, an engagement testing a, a, an IoT device. It was like a security device, right? Um, and that involved a lot of cryptography and a lot of random number generation as part of the cryptography. And so um, on a lark, we just sort of asked like, hey, uh, like what are you guys doing for uh, random number generation like on the device? They answered, oh, well, there, our SOC has a uh, hardware random number generator embedded on it. So we just sort of use that. And so then on a lark, I just asked like, hey, could you just like give me like a gigabyte file, like just like a big dump of numbers from the RNG just so I can look at it, right? Just to like see how good or bad it is. Kind of expected to just check out, you know, it's, a, it's literally a piece of hardware designed to do just this one thing right. Um, and immediately uh, it just failed all the statistical randomness tasks we threw at it, which was concerning. And then you just look at the file, you kind of scroll through it, and just large swaths of it are zero. And this was very concerning. Uh, and to the point, I was thinking like, surely this must be like some crazy buggy code or like, like what is going on here? And uh, that sort of leads us uh, down to uh, the, basically everything that came out of this presentation. So uh, th this is uh, where I'd like to uh, segue into what I want, I want to call Petro's Law. That's me. Uh, if I could have one law, one eponymous law, help me out here DEF CON, it would be this. It can always be worse. No matter how bad you think it is, it can always be worse. So you might think, wow, entire device to, uh, making crypto keys of zero, how could it be worse than that? Let me show you. Uninitialized memory. So you might recall that the uh, HAL RNG function uh, uses an output variable uh, from uh, the uh, the call to store uh, mem the, the the output from because you has to use the return code for the error code. Um, well, lots of uh, the HAL RNG functions will operate in a way that they don't actually set the value uh, to anything in case of an error. Sometimes they'll set it to zero, and that's how you get all those zeros. But not every device works that way. Sometimes if there's an error code, it just won't touch your variable. So if you do something like this where you um, uh, declare but uh, not instantiate a variable as your random number, right, it'll just be something in RAM. And then uh, you send it to the HAL RNG function and then send that on its way out onto the internet or what, to a potential adversary. You're basically heart bleeding yourself like through the random, you think you're sending a random number to your adversary but actually sending tiny chunks of your RAM. Uh, basically like heart bleed style like on your device. And what's so bad is like it'll actually sort of kind of look like random numbers some of the time too. Uh, and this is very likely to occur in the real world where you might be doing something like a Diffie-Hellman key exchange where like the very first thing you do is generate a random number and send it to the other guy. Um, so uh, yeah, that's terrifying. 
So one of the things we want to touch on is that uh, there was a talk a given, let's see, was this uh, 2019, I believe, uh, that they, they looked through a large number of certificates, and um, like millions of them, and they found that one in 172 of the certificates were vulnerable to attack. Now, I'm not saying that what we're presenting today is what they found, but I'm saying that what we're talking about is what they found. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, in this uh, uh, research in particular, the, they called out low entropy IoT devices um, as like one of the like reasons that all these certificates were failing. Um, uh, so one of the things that we uh, immediately r realized upon doing this research is that one of the things you should expect to see if this were the case was that lots of IoT devices out in the wild should be like generating bad certificates. And lo and behold, that's like exactly what we see. And so uh, this might actually very well be like the cause of um, this prior research. So uh, this sounds all nice and tidy, right? Like those, those stupid users just keep on calling things wrong, ignoring the error code of the HAL RNG function, like a, a tale of the oldest time, and all we gotta do is get them to use the stupid functions, right? Those stupid users. Like, well, let's actually walk through this a little bit more, right? So uh, th the very top here is uh, some code from the, uh, the MediaTek uh, uh, documentation from the 7697. It has the HAL RNG, the TRNG function, I fucking hate the name TRNG, uh, get random number, uh, you give it the output variable, it's checking the error code. And that has this um, comment in here that says error handle. Uh, it turns out that that comment handle error is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, the problem is that when you're doing some security critical piece of logic, right, and you need a random number, you really need it. You can't just continue on without it and handle the error, right? It's sort of critical to the core thing you're trying to do at that time. So you kind of just have two options. There's one, which is to spin loop. This is actually recommended in some of the documentation, and it's terrible. You're just going to keep on calling it using 100% CPU, spin looping, maybe forever in case of like a broken peripheral. Like that's a terrible solution. Why would you ever suggest people to do that? Why would you ever expect uh, developers to do that? Um, the second is just to quit out and kill the process entirely. Like, can you imagine if, like, you're in the networking stack, right? Like, you're making TLS connections to somebody else, and, uh, like, you, the, the RNG function generates an error, which happens all the time. Like, if you're trying to make a 46, a 4096 bit RSA key, uh, and you call the RNG function really, really quickly, you're literally going to be incapable of creating an RSA key, basically, um, using the RNG functions this way. It'll just quit out of the, like, the entire network. Like, it'll be a stupid and broken and useless device. So, what do you give developers? Well, if they can't handle the errors, YOLO. Uh, <laughs> You just go for option number three, which is to ignore the error. And doing that has some consequences. It's not that it's, you, how do I say this? You, really, it's not the fault of the user. You can't blame them here. They're stuck in a no-win situation. RNG and IoT is fundamentally broken. And now, there are some right ways to do RNG. Um, the, what we're going to probably be talking about for the majority of the talk from here on out is why you need a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator. So let's talk about the right way to RNG. As a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator has some distinct advantages, namely it never blocks execution. So we don't have that problem of, uh, well, wait, well, we're just going to stop the network stack. You don't have to worry about that here. API calls don't fail. It specifically, and this is the big thing that you should hear, it pulls entropy from multiple sources. So if you have an IoT device, it's probably got one hardware RNG. Now, <laughs> the problem with seeding a, anything, even if it's a pseudo-random random generator, with only a single source is that if you're an attacker and you control that source, you can predict what the end number is going to be. This is how tool assisted speedruns work. As an attacker playing a physical Nintendo, I'm controlling the only source of entropy, which is player input, thereby guaranteeing that I always get exactly the results I want and the deterministic behavior out of the pseudo random number generator. So you don't want to rely on a single source that an attacker can take advantage of. Instead, you should be pooling your entropy from multiple sources such that an attacker would have to have full control of every single source at the same time 
in order to manipulate that. There's also the big advantage of cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators. And I'm not even going to try to get to, into the saying spring. I'm going to say CSP RNGs always return cryptographic quality results. We're going to come back to that in a second. Uh, and this is how every major operating system works. Linux, Mac, Windows, BSD, Solaris, they all have some method of doing CSP RNG and IoT should as well. Anything else you want to say on that topic? Yeah, so the, um, uh, the CSP RNG subsystem basically works like the diagram here, right? You're going to uh, stretch out that initial entropy pool uh, indefinitely going forward. In practice, the uh, algorithms for doing this can actually be rather simple. Um, the easiest way to construct one of these is just by using a hashing function. So you just take the entropy pool and you just like MD5 it. Um, you can pick whatever hashing function that you prefer. I like MD5. Uh, you MD5 your entropy pool, right? And then um, in order to produce uh, like the next uh, uh, batch, you can MD5 the entropy pool and also the like the, the, the last thing you just made. And you can keep on chaining that out indefinitely going forward so until like uh, that way uh, you can kind of keep on making bits like in, in infinitely into the future. Um, what's nice about that is because it's a, a cryptographically secure hashing function, you can't go backwards. There's no way to take the uh, like bits output from it and then derive the seed or any of the other values um, therein. Because you also need to know the entropy rule itself. And you can switch around those seeds. And like Alan was saying, that's basically how this works everywhere else, just not in the world of IoT. So yeah, the, basically uh, we're going to go into uh, why you really do need a CSP RNG subsystem and no, you really can't just make do without it. So nobody codes from scratch, right? If you have a library that does what you want, you're going to use that library. And in IOTs, there's lots of reference and example code uh, for how to call hardware random number generators, even libraries that do it for you. But sometimes the reference code has vulnerabilities that propagate. Uh, there are some really uh, unfortunate examples of this, uh, Kentucky and MediaTek. Do you want to actually talk about these ones? Because yeah, you, yeah. you know this the best. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, the way that uh, uh, some libraries work, uh, such as uh, Kentucky NG, um, we specifically been using the Nordic R uh, NRF uh, 8420 uh, uh, SOC, as well as uh, the Linkit uh, 7697 um, Arduino code. Uh, when you uh, call it for a hardware, you call the HAL function, you might think like, I'm going to be getting a number from the hardware RNG, right? Uh, that's not actually how it works. All it does is take the hardware RNG, generate a seed, and then uh, use libc random there forward. So you're actually not even using the hardware RNG, really. You're just using libc random. Um, that is as broken as it sounds. And uh, for that, we actually have a demo video. Let's see if the audio works on this. There's a uh, audio on this, so if there's anybody that needs to turn that on in the audio section, then uh, they should be good. So for this demo, we built an IoT security camera device. It takes pictures every few minutes, just like a real security camera, and posts them to a publicly accessible That's website. Not playing. So the only thing oh, keeping an attacker oh, from being oh, yeah. able to view your photos is that each file is named with this long random no, file name here, chosen by the camera. Uh, now, before you go, th yeah, it's, it's not playing. It's playing. No, but the video's not changing. Yeah. Hey, oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. See that? Wait, wait. Ha ha. All right. Well, you get to so for this demo, we built an IoT security camera device. <laughs> it takes pictures every few minutes, just like a real security camera, and posts them to a publicly accessible website. Okay. So the only thing keeping an attacker from being able to right, view your photos exactly. is that each file is named with this long random file name here, chosen by the camera. Uh, now, before you go thinking that this is unrealistically vulnerable, uh, this is how Discord works and lots of other applications like it. Anytime you take a photo and send it to a friend over Discord, it's publicly accessible. Uh, the long random file name is the only thing that's keeping people from seeing your photos. Uh, our device, however, is built using Contiki NG, a popular IoT operating system. Uh, when you call the operating system to get a random number, it will use the hardware RNG on board, but only to seed the insecure libc rand function. So we don't know what the seed is, but we don't have to because we can derive it. So suppose one day you take a photo with your camera and post it on social media. Wow, what a cool camera you bought. How fun. But what you didn't know is that an attacker can use this file name to derive what the original seed was that generated it. That's because that's how the libc ran function works. Our attacker here uses untwister to find the seed. Once they have, they can use that seed to determine every past and future value from the RNG. So our attacker can just 
plug in some of those numbers back into the camera website and view every photo that the camera has ever taken, even if they've never been shared before. Yeah. Phew. Alt tab. Excellent. We're back. Oh, that was demo. Cool. So um, anytime we talk about random number generation and security, the conversation invariably goes to exploitability about like how exploitable is this really, right? Because sometimes they turn out to be like uh, cryptographic vulnerabilities where um, uh, crypto is often considered broken if you're able to like break it even just a little bit. Like if you're able to derive an AAS key, uh, like 128-bit AAS key and 127 bits, that's like considered broken in cryptographic terms. Um, and sometimes uh, RNG vulnerabilities are the same way. Uh, it turns out this is uh, very uh, real and very exploitable, but just not in a very canned way. So the very often what you're going to find here is that it's going to depend on the particulars of the individual device that you're looking at, right? Like, again, like I was saying earlier, the, the IoT devices tend to be really heterogeneous and very different. There's not any single piece of logic that all IoT devices, like, use. Not all of them talk over uh, HTTP. Not all of them even use TCP IP. So, uh, you're likely to need to look into the individual business logic of the individual device that you're looking at. So it's very unlikely to be a, like, you're doing it wrong dot pi, that kind of like, you could just point at devices and, like, exploit. Um, so uh, to keep that in mind. Uh, one exception to this, one perhaps notable exception to this, is specifically asymmetric cryptography. So one of the things that will cause these RNG HAL functions to fail is calling them very quickly over and over again. And if you're trying to make a 2048 or 4096-bit uh, like RSA key, you're going to need a lot of bits, and you're going to have to call the RNG function in a loop over and over again. And it's a very reliable way of causing the RNG functions to fail. And so, uh, if you were a pen tester and you're looking at, at like trying to use this in your upcoming IoT engagement, I would definitely keep an eye at um, any asymmetric cryptography that your IoT device is trying to do, uh, especially um, if you're able to look at the code. Then uh, uh, like see if it's checking the uh, error codes coming out of the HAL uh, function. And uh, if not, then there's a very good chance that virtually all of the asymmetric keys that it's creating have just big chunks of zeros in them. Um, there's also um, a separate talk at this DEF CON called The Mechanics of Compromising Low Entropy RSA Keys. We did not plan this. Uh, that's just kind of a thing that happened. So there's also, I haven't, I haven't seen that talk yet. Uh, there might be some um, interesting new uh, exploits coming out of that that might be practical for pen testers to use on like actually using some RSA keys uh, that have um, a bunch of zeros in them. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you are a pen tester again and uh, you have uh, like an IoT engagement coming up, uh, whether you have source code or not, whether this is uh, like white box or not, is going to dictate a lot of like how you're going to um, try to like attack this going forward. It, uh, try to tax the RNG as much as possible. So if there's like a remote request that you can perform to the device that you know will cause it to use the RNG, basically spam those requests and see if they start coming back zero. Um, and uh, that would be like a really good way of um, trying to uh, see that. Or if you um, uh, know that there's going to be like an asymmetric cr cryptography, then keep an eye at that, out for that. Okay, so <laughs> this is th he had his law. Mine is somewhat different. Alan's law is going to be never write your own RNG code. It's as dangerous as writing your own crypto code. Everyone knows now, or everyone really ought to know by now, that you don't write your own crypto code. It's very difficult to do right. Well, this is at the same level. It's no different than crypto code in part because there are so many ways to do it wrong. We already talked about the user is already in a bad situation as it is, but even if you manage to do all of the other things right, there are still some interesting gotchas. Sometimes the hardware itself has things you would never expect to encounter. One of the examples we ran into was the LPC 54628. There is a warning on page 1106 that says, if you want actually random numbers, you have to ask for a random number, then ask for 32 more random numbers, but throw those away then ask for another random number, then throw another 32 away, and repeat until you have the length key you want. Now, if you saw this code written down, you might think it was a mistake. 
unless someone heavily commented why they were doing this, you would read this code and think that they were insane or that they'd written it wrong. But that's what you have to do in order to talk to this particular hardware RNG correctly. And this isn't the only bad example. Um, even, even if you are, you, this, I'm, this is pivoting the talk a little bit, but I'm going to get passionate about this one. Even if you do everything right, you read that 1,000 page manual, you find the weirdness, <sighs> you're still not out of the weeds. You can call the hardware RNG, spin loop, do everything right, and then get random numbers that are not random. So this is an example of taking a large multi-gig file of randomness and then doing a statistical analysis of how often each byte uh, happens to appear. So 0 through 255 which bytes are, are happening or which values are happening more often in this byte. And what we find on the MediaTek 7697 is this very interesting sawtooth pattern. What you would expect to see is that every byte happens with an even distribution. They're all happening at the same frequency. And that's not what's happening at all. And if you zoom in a little bit, you can actually see that the sawtooth pattern of unequal frequency repeats, which is even more mysterious. And we would really like to understand what exactly was happening there. I'm going to let you take this one. So you think, surely it can't get worse. Um, so uh, basically what the, a lot of this involved was uh, we had to write code for all of these uh, individual dev boards, these socks, right? Bought up like every uh, like, internet of things uh, dev board that we could get. Write code for them that would uh, generate random numbers uh, and store them out to a big file, like a couple of gigs worth of files, and then analyze them offline. Um, uh, one uh, that's actually really hard to do logistically, that uh, very often dev boards are just not set up to do this and had to have some like janky setups of like uploading it to a web server that we were connecting because the only way of getting IO out of the thing was Wi-Fi and like sometimes you can output it over a serial line, sometimes you, they can only read and not write over serial. It was a complete mess. Um, so the, that's kind of the analysis that you're looking at here is us finally like, okay, no more shenanigans, no more like weird API gotchas, no more like uh, silly randomness stuff that can happen through the APIs. Like what is the actual randomness of the devices themselves, the hardware RNG? Like what does the entropy look like coming out of these things? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, so this is, yeah, this is obviously not great. Um, uh, obviously repeating patterns and cryptography don't go well, uh, along very well together. Um, this is from the, the Nordic NRF uh, 52840. Um, it has a, a, a curious repeating 12-bit pattern. Um, it has uh, three zeros, uh, the 12 bits, that repeat every uh, exactly um, in hex 50 bytes, except sometimes it jumps. Uh, it'll go like 80 or so. Um, this was so perplexing and so weird that we thought for sure it must have been a mistake in our instrumentation for the longest time. And no matter what we did, um, it wouldn't go away. So yeah, we think it's, it's not that for a few reasons. Um, one of which being that, like, we, we looked at the code for a really long time and have no idea how there could possibly be a 12-bit repeating pattern. If it was one bit, you'd think, like, maybe it's like a null terminated string, you're copying it around stupidly. I'm completely capable of writing that code. Um, but 12 bits, like, how does that even happen? Um, so yeah, that was uh, very concerning. Um, it, it also sort of uh, says something as well that like even if it turns out that uh, so also we're going to be uh, releasing all I think it's up now uh, releasing all of our code on our GitHub. So it's on GitHub.com slash Bishop Fox. There's a, a a repo called You're Doing It Wrong that has all of the source code to the devices that we did and also uh, some of our results, things like that. Um, so um, it, it's entirely possible that maybe this was the result of some buggy code, but also uh, you have to consider what it means that uh, you know two computer security experts spent months analyzing RNGs and spent months trying to find bugs in the RNG code that they wrote and still failed at it. Like, what does that say about the state of IoT and security um, having to do with RNGs going forward? That's very true for the STM32. Uh, in this case, I took an L432KC, try to say that fast, uh, tried to get good random numbers out of this, and I failed. And I tried again, and I got some help, and I failed. And we tried again, and tried blocking in a different way, and we still failed. The initial numbers we got out of this looked terrible because we weren't actually doing the blocking correctly. Once we got all of the blocking, fully worked out. We were spin looping every time we needed to wait for the air condition to clear, only getting random numbers from the device. We still had a problem. It was mostly clean, but then when we ran it through Die Harder, which is a suite of statistical analysis tests, it still managed to fail a 
particular minimum distance test with a high degree of certainty. I'm going to let him try to explain this part of it. Yeah, so there's a well-known tool called Die Harder, excellent name, that uh, is a statistical randomness test that's used outside of security. People use this for other things to like evaluate random number generators. Um, and uh, it has a number of tests, one of which being the um, RGB minimum distance test. RGB is just the initials of the like, dude who, named it, uh, who made it. So uh, the minimum distance test is basically you take a bunch of numbers and you interpret them as uh, integers in n-dimensional space and then calculate using a very simple algorithm what the smallest distance between any of the numbers is. So really what this is doing is trying to find uh, repeated values or nearly repeated values. So you can imagine a world where like you have a faulty random number generator where some value depends on uh, some other value that's earlier on in the sequence, right? And maybe it's not always exactly the same. Maybe it's like it jumps a little bit or something like that. Those kinds of uh, correlations between data can be really hard to, to, uh, to pick out. And there's lots of ways of trying to find them. This isn't the only way, obviously. Um, but the way that this works uh, uh, is that like, if there's any repeats, there's going to be uh, uh, two points in that space that are going to be like, unnaturally close to each other. And so when you do the subtraction, um, they turn out to be zero or near zero. So you can run this test and it'll kind of uh, tell you whether things fall into expected parameters or not. So this one was curious only because we never quite figured out exactly what was going wrong with the STM32, uh, like exactly what that repeated value was or like how concerned we should be exactly about it. Um, but the whole point of uh, hopefully this presentation is that you shouldn't need to care about this sort of thing, that uh, you should never trust the output of the hardware random number generator raw. Like this is a thing that you should be using as an input to a cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator and not like on its own. So we have some conclusions for you, and uh, some of them are going to be bigger than any one person, because this affects the entire IoT industry. It's not a single vendor, it's not a single device, it's not a single library, it's kind of across the board. It really points out that the only viable solution is a CSP RNG subsystem that is implemented in software. So. This can't be fixed by changing documentation and blaming users. I'm going to steal a line from him. The good news is that this can be fixed through software. The bad news is it has to be fixed through software, and we're talking about IoT devices here. Uh, RN RNG, I said this earlier, RNG code should be considered dangerous to write on your own. It's just like crypto code. You really need to have a viable subsystem that you can call that's already been vetted. Um, and last but not least, if we haven't shown you uh, this at least uh, enough examples of it, there are more out there we didn't include here that you can find in a, uh, an article we wrote on, uh, what was it, bishopfox.com? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have even more examples of bad stuff, but you really don't know how strong or weak your hardware RNG is actually going to be. It's really hard to tell. Cool. And so uh, what can you actually do about this? Uh, well, it kind of depends on where you are, like what, uh, who you are. So first is uh, device owners. Um, like this is going to have to be some sort of a, a software fix. Um, IoT devices, not known for their uh, ability to be uh, patched out in the wild. But uh, at least it's possible certainly for some devices that have the ability to do over-the-air updates, um, especially ones that are um, particularly sensitive to a uh, random number, like if it's a, uh, like a security device, then hopefully this will be a thing. Um, uh, for IoT developers, um, there's like this emerging uh, like space of um, IoT operating systems, things like uh, uh, Riot OS, um, there's a Kentucky NG, uh, FreeRTOS. Um, we don't have a particular one that we would recommend over the other, but um, the uh, uh, CSPRNG subsystem is definitely most likely to occur there since the uh, individual device SDKs are you're, you're unlikely to see this sort of feature here. Um, those are mostly about device enablement, like hardware enablement, and not so much about um, trying to implement features that make like a full device. So um, yeah, if you're developing a whole new uh, device from scratch, I'd really recommend using one of those. Um, one, because they're actually pretty handy and there's other benefits to them aside from security, um, but that's certainly where the security is. There's a reason that uh, this is not a problem in servers and laptops and desktops, because there's an operating system. You can just ask Linux, like, hey, please give me a random number. Just ask dev you random for a random number and it'll just give it to you and it's perfect. Um, but uh, this is not true in the IoT world and it really needs one. 
So uh, IoT device manufacturers and those OS developers, um, you really do need to implement the CSPRNG subsystem. Like that, there's not an, a, a way around it. You can't just change the documentation. You can't just call the how function like bad or try to change the documentation to get people to check the error codes. None of that stuff is sufficient. Um, this uh, it can't just uh, uh, change by blaming users. Um, disallowing users, certainly deprecating the, the how functions for the RNGs would be a nice way, and perhaps even just disabling users from being able to use them entirely uh, would be a good way to go forward. Um, and for pen testers, uh, keep an eye out for this. This is, this is likely to be a perennial uh, finding for uh, years to come. Uh, certainly, uh, if you have an IoT engagement coming up, then um, keep an eye out for this. Uh, if you, um, especially if you have access to source code, then um, trying to find it could be pretty simple. And then building out an exploit um, is going to be highly contextually dependent, but um, entirely possible. Um, and that's about it. Yes, yeah, so thanks a lot. Uh, you're from Fish Fox again. I'm Dan Petro. I'm Alan Cecil. And uh, I think we're going to do a uh, Q&A. I think we have how much time? We have? Five minutes. We have five minutes? Okay. Well, maybe we have time for a question or two. If somebody wants to kind of shout, um, we can like repeat a question. There. I see a hand. Do your very best to shout. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I didn't hear much of that, I'm afraid. <laughs> but perhaps you could come a little bit closer. I. Yeah, um, so I guess the question is like, you know, maybe how hard is it to implement your own CSPRNG subsystem is a, maybe a decent way to, uh, to, to do that. There's a couple of ways you can do that by like the hashing function, I think. Like there's like a two line um, uh, RNG like code that you can do. Um, those uh, are, like if you're in a real pinch, um, then those are probably better than just like making the call to the HAL function yourself. Um, there's definitely a lot that can go wrong in the development of a CSPRNG subsystem uh, that's non-trivial and uh, uh, in the abstract, I'd love to say to not try to make that yourself, but it's not the end of the world. Um, it's like it's certainly a lot better than the alternative of just like YOLOing the HAL function. Um, and yes, there's a lot of um, implementations of that that are like simpler than others. And the simpler you can get, probably the better, as long as you're sure that it's actually a CSPRNG sub uh, RNG uh, uh, and not uh, just like you know a, um, a linear congruential generator or something like that. Yeah, and again, if you can if you can source from multiple entropy pools, I, I don't really care what you use. Just try to find more than one entropy source, so an attacker would have to control all the variables at once. Time is not a variable that you should use. <laughs> cool. Uh, do we have uh, yes, right in front. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So there is a FIPS standard. It's like FIPS 140-2 or something like that. I, I want to say around a specifically random number generation. And the question is like, did we notice any difference between like ones that were like FIPS certified and ones that aren't? I think the short answer is no. Uh, that like the certification, I, I, the, the, so the best that we found was um, specifically around um, ST Microelectronics had like a proof of randomness. They had, had their own code you could look at. So huge uh, shout outs to ST for that. Um, but otherwise, uh, like, I don't think we really noticed a difference between like FIPS certified uh, devices and otherwise. Yeah. And one thing I should note is we were trying to replicate STM32's, uh, or the results that uh, ST Micro uh, released. We were trying to validate and replicate those results and we couldn't do it. So it might be that it's the same device from a vendor might work differently than the next one. Same, same exact model family, just a different device and somehow is less random. We don't know. Cool. So I think that we're going to be doing, uh, is there a room for Q&A that? Uh, chill out, Bob. Chill out. Uh, follow the mob of people that is invariably going to be following us uh, to a Q&A session afterward. We'll keep answering questions for a while. But otherwise, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much.